Okay, so the causes of World War One, uh, World War Two in the Pacific, to what extent was Japan responsible for the Pacific War? Last time in class, uh, we already looked at this, and a couple of questions come to mind. Um, number one was Japan planning for the war from the early 1930s, um, and that was one of the plus one perspective that Japan wanted a war in the early 1930s, and the emperor was involved, and Japan was uh, pretending to be willing to negotiate for peace. But uh, the reason why they were willing to, they were saying that they wanted to negotiate peace was really to surprise people. So that when they start a war, it's a surprise attack. That's one perspective. Uh, and, um, and that's also the perspective that uh, David Bergam, Bergamini had. And this, this was really, you know, this idea was really, um, it was released in 1971. Now, uh, another perspective that on uh, Japan's degree of responsibility in World War II is that Japan was pursuing a traditional imperialism. You need to remember at that time Japan uh, modeled itself after um, the, the Western imperial powers. In the Meiji Restoration, which we haven't looked at but we will look at in the future, but in the Meiji Restoration, Japan uh, went through a modernization process in which they got the British, they copied the British Navy. They um, copied uh, the German military, and to some extent, they also copied American uh, imperialism, in which, uh, you know, in the, later on in the Russo-Japanese War, uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually comes out, and there's actually some documentation of Ter Ter Teddy Roosevelt, the president at that time, praising America, sorry, praising Japan for what they do, for, what the, for pursuing a successful um, empire in Asia. So, this traditional imperial, this point of view is similar to uh, the, the point of view on Hitler and how Hitler you know, took too many risks and stumbled into war. Same thing, Japan was pursuing the, like I said earlier, but not this one, not this one either, okay. Japan was pursuing the co-prosperity sphere in Asia, and because uh, Japan took too many risks, they stumbled into war. That's another perspective. However, a counter argument to that perspective is Japan's declaration of war. Hi there, on here. Thank you. Uh, another, but a counter argument towards Japan's, uh, you know, stumbling into war is that they they were the ones who declared war. If they stumbled into war, why would they declare war? Right. And, uh, but, and so, therefore, Japan should be responsible. However, the counter-argument to that is Japan was aiming to liberate Asia from Western domination and, uh, and similar to that of America in South America. And therefore, Japan fought a de defensive war uh, triggered by U.S. embargoes, meaning, um, meaning when America decided to cut off uh, the oil and rubber supply to um, Japan. Japan actually only had six months of oil left. And because, and because uh, America cut off the oil, Japan had no choice but to declare war. And hopefully finish the war in six months. And uh, at that time, Japan was very well aware of the fact that if they could not, you know, decisively take out the Americans in Pearl Harbor, they, they, one of the admirals pretty much came out and said that yeah, Japan's going to lose if we cannot finish the Americans at Pearl Harbor. Um, but that's, we'll talk more about that later on. One of the difficult things about analyzing Japan uh, and its responsibility for starting World War II, and who is responsible for World War II, is, is that there is a lack of a figurehead. Now in uh, Germany, in World War II in Germany, who was responsible? Hitler, right? Everyone can say he, Hitler was pretty much a pivotal character, and uh, other than um, I think uh, what's his name again? Guy, guy who starts with F. His name, Fritz. Fritz, 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 Fritz Fischer. Fritz Fischer, right? Other than Fritz Fischer saying that you know it was Germany's war and not Hitler's war, um, uh, that's one perspective. But it's very similar in that the lack of figurehead in Japan. Who was really in charge? The prime minister was a, kind of a liberal prime minister, more of a democrat prime minister. And, but at the same time, 
really had no power. The parliament had no power. So the government, so the political government at that time was, you know, their role in starting World War II is really questionable. On the other hand, the military was in power, but at the same time, the military, who, who is the military? Right? Maybe some head generals. But at the same time, you can't really point your finger at one of them. Is the emperor responsible? I don't know. Hirohito was the emperor, but at the same time, because he, uh, Japan practiced traditionally what is known as a shadow leadership, in which the emperor does not come out and uh, say, uh, the emperor will rarely come out and say things. And there's almost, uh, and there's very rare, like very little documentation between uh, the Japanese emperor and the military generals that you really don't know what, to what extent was Hirohito responsible for the war. And later on, Hirohito was tried for the war and was acquitted. And he was basically, you know, even to this day, the, the Japanese emperor still exists. Like, and you could see, um, you guys, did you guys see the address by the Japanese emperor? Yeah. The, about the nuclear, the nuclear, uh, oh. the tsunami and the nuclear yeah. uh, power plant that's happening in Japan right now. The emperor came out and said so. And uh, the other big occasion that happened in the past was, you know, when they dropped the atomic bomb, uh, the emperor came out and said things too. I think there are some times in between which the emperor also said things, but these are the two more catastrophic situations. And so the emperor was retained. Some people say that the emperor was retained so that America could fight the Cold War. Um, and that the, uh, that the emperor should be responsible. And this, and w later on, we look at the Tokyo trials, uh, which is you know, the, which kind of closes off the World War II in Asia. You know, in the West, they had the Nuremberg trials where they tried the Germans for their war crimes, for uh, you know, um, Auschwitz, uh, the Holocaust. Um, they tried the Germans there. Asia had something similar where they uh, tried the Japanese in the Tokyo trials. But the Japanese, many of the Japanese leaders were actually not punished. We'll be looking at that later on in the future. So, <clears throat> long-term causes. We're going to start looking at the long-term causes of uh, World War II for Japan. Now, Japan's uh, relation with the West traditionally has been that of isolation. Japan was isolated from the West. They did not really want to deal with the West. And even though they did have... Um, um, some trade with uh, the Dutch, right? So they had some trade with the Dutch, the Dutch in uh, in the port of uh, Tashima and uh, Nagasaki, and that was really one of their main points. And you could see, you know, even in the Warring States era of Japan, you would see, um, and maybe if you play some video games, any of you guys play some video games of you know, Oda Nobunaga? Uh, no, you guys. Starcraft? Not quite Starcraft. No. <laughs> Yeah, something like some you, know, you guys know there's a Changguk Musam. Oh, oh yeah, that's fun. Changguk Musam, yeah. right? Uh, um, no, there's a Sangguk Musam and there's Changguk Musam. Uh, Changguk chang, chang Musam. Is it Chan? 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 Changguk Musam. Is that another War, yeah, it's like, not Sangguk Musam. Oh. But there's a Japanese War in States 1. And in there, you see people having guns and stuff. Because Japan actually... Had, similar to China, already had guns in the, 16th, in the you know, 17th century. They already had guns there. But isolationism was, was set because they did, because the Japanese were aware of the Christians and they thought, they saw, they perceived the Christians as a threat to their civilization. Um, their government was feudal and they were feudal politically, economically, um, and socially. They maintained a feudal state. And what I mean by a feudal state is they had a system. Feudal state? A feudal state. Feudalism. What does that mean? Right? Which is uh, feudalism. And what that basically means is you know, the, the hierarchy, there would be, uh, number one, at the very top would be the, um, is, um, is the whiteboard on the map, can you check? Um, the top would be the emperor. Is that, yeah, okay. I should use black, I guess. At the very top would be the emperor. Underneath the emperor is a shogun. 
but needs a shogun have a daimyos? But daimyos literally means they don't. <laughs> uh, which means uh, the rich landowners. But beneath the daimyos are the samurai. Beneath the samurai are the peasants. Right, and that's kind of the system with uh, the feudalism, which you know there is kind of like a triangle. And which the upper, there's only one emperor, there was only one shogun. Shogun was the military leader of Japan at that time. Daimyos are those who, the, the great, the big landlords who spread across Japan. And uh, the daimyos also had samurai who, you know, pledged loyalty to them and fought for them. And underneath are the peasants. And that was a system that uh, Japan had um, when it first got in contact with the daimyo, daimyos, daimyo. And that's... And it literally means tato, like big field owners. <laughs> Dutch traders came around, and, and so, so the Dutch traders were there. Uh, and until and this system pretty much lasted until Commodore Perry came about. And Commodore Perry is this guy. Right? Commodore Perry was uh, as, was an American official under the command of uh, President Millard Fillmore to travel. West to set a relationship with China, uh, set a relationship with uh, Japan, and at that time, it's you need to know that at that time it was um, after China has just lost the, the uh, Opium War, the, both of the Opium Wars, and Japan knew about China. But I'll talk about that in a second. Here is a Japanese painting of the ship at that time, and this was called Gun Gunboat Diplomacy. You need to know this term. Gun boat diplomacy, and you'll learn more about uh, you'll learn more about this in the future as well. But yeah, gunboat diplomacy, and gunboat diplomacy was really basically you send a a gunboat there, a big iron ship there, um, and you shoot a few cannons, scare the Japanese, start business. That's basically the whole idea. And in fact, it was interesting that uh, when they went to Japan, Japan was so unaware of international law that Miller Film, uh, not Miller Film, uh, Commodore Perry actually had to um, write a letter saying, okay, we're going to shoot a couple of cannons. Here's a white flag. When you finally are willing to surrender, you raise the white flag. Right? Because the Japanese had no idea what a white flag meant. And so they don't know how to surrender. And they had no idea what a white flag means, okay, I'm surrendering. And so Commodore Perry actually had to give them the white flag and say, okay, this is, what, this is how you surrender. I'm going to start shooting now. <laughs> and uh, of course the Japanese surrendered. Um, they were first to open up their, open up their door for the uh, they partially opened up to the Dutch. Like I said earlier, they opened the trade with the Dutch at, uh, the, Shin, at the port of the Shima in Nagasaki. Uh, 